Hello again. Perfect. Um, okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome. Thank you for joining us once again on our daily Sharks for Kids webinars. We're very excited about all our talks and guests for the week to come. Um, so please be patient with us as we're still trying to figure out some things. Um, today, we are finally broadcasting live on YouTube. So if you know anyone who hasn't been able to get on the Zoom uh, or who doesn't know how to use it, feel free to let them know. It's on our Sharks for Kids YouTube page. Um, it's all, the link is also being posted on social media. Um, as always, if you have any questions for our guests, um, please leave them in the Q&A box. Try and keep them relevant to the presentation. We get a lot of questions coming through uh, and we just can't answer them all. Um, if they're about general, generally about sharks in general, feel free to go and look on our website because we have loads of resources there that can give you all the information you need. Or you can also um, tune in to Gillian's talk on Thursday. Um, please be respectful in anything you write on our questions and in the chat as we have a lot of children watching. Um, we get so many questions every day and we just can't answer them all. Um, but for now, I'm just going to introduce our, new, our guest today, Dr. David Schiffman. Um, David is a marine conservation biologist who studies sharks, the policies we can use to protect them and how science influences these policies. He's currently a postdoctoral researcher at Arizona State University and is based in Washington, DC. Hi, David. Hi. How are you? I'm doing okay. Uh, thank, thanks for having me today. Yeah, thanks for being here and for giving the talk. Uh, it's always great to have a wide range of people on. So yesterday we had Annie Hensel in um, North Carolina and today mm -hmm. it's you. Um, so why don't you introduce yourself in a little bit more detail? Sure. Uh, so yeah, I am, again, my name is Dr. David Schiffman. I study uh, shark conservation and from the policy side, which means the rules and the laws that uh, help protect the ocean. And that's why I'm based here in Washington, DC, where many of those rules are made. Uh, in simpler times, I am an easy uh, five or 10 minute walk from the headquarters of NOAA, which is the, the US government building, uh, the US government agency that makes all these rules. Uh, but right now, as with everyone else, I'm just staying home. Uh, so the sort of stuff I've worked on in the past is uh, what do sharks eat? Where do they go? What do they do? Basic questions like that. Uh, and I've moved on to uh, a lot of this policy side of how to protect threatened species using science, using better laws and things like that. Uh, so should I, should I start sharing, sharing the screen and start the? Yeah, um, before okay. we kick off, I have one question okay. for you, which I ask Please. all our guests. Uh, what's your favorite shark? So I, I will, I have a whole slide on that in the Perfect. talk, but I'll tell you early. Uh, and that is the sandbar shark. Follow hashtag best shark on Twitter and Instagram to learn all about why I love, why I love sandbar sharks. Great, uh, so I'll leave are, the floor to you then. Yeah. Uh, great, all right, I'm going to attempt to share, share my screen. It worked a minute ago. Looks like it's working. Okay, so hi, again, I'm Dr. David Schiffman. Uh, these are some, some pictures of what I do. Uh, a lot of what I do is being out in the field and, and measuring sharks and taking blood samples from sharks and tagging sharks. Uh, we're very careful uh, to use methods that don't hurt the sharks when we do this. I also spend a lot of time talking uh, about sharks on the news, uh, talking to journalists, writing a lot of articles myself. I actually have a monthly column in Scuba Diving Magazine and I have an Ask a Marine Biologist column in another scuba publication called Sport Diver Magazine. So if anyone has any questions about sharks or the ocean or anything, email me. I'll share my contact info at the end and I might answer it in a future column in Sport Diver Magazine. And my favorite thing to do is talking to the public, talking to the kids especially. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, so sharks are a really ancient and diverse group of fishes. They are fish. Uh, they are a little different from uh, the, 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 uh, the main group of fishes, which are called the bony fishes. That's the goldfish and the tuna and the bass and everything else, something like 38,000 species of those. Uh, but there are, uh, sharks are fish, but there are, their skeletons are made of cartilage, not bone. And th these are some of the ancient sharks 
uh, the photo of me standing there inside of jaw, that's Megalodon. Uh, many aquariums and science museums have Megalodon jaws like this for you to set up. They are indeed quite large. Just a quick note, Megalodon, definitely extinct. They did exist. They are definitely extinct. That's one of the strangest uh, conspiracy theories that I regularly deal with uh, because I also do a lot of public science engagement talking to people on social media, speaking in schools. There's this idea that Megalodon is not extinct, it's just hiding. Uh, that's not how any of this works. So lots of people know uh, the famous shark species like the great white and the bull and the tiger shark, uh, but there are over 550 known species of sharks as of the latest Sharks of the World book. And they come in just about every shape and size and color you can imagine. Uh, some of them are about the size of a human arm. Some of them are the size of a school bus. Uh, some of them live on coral reefs. Some live under Arctic ice. Uh, some live so deep that light never reaches and they can generate their own light. So I want to tell you some of my favorite shark species uh, before we get into, uh, uh, get into a little bit of the science and conservation here, and then we'll leave you with some time for questions at the end. So you, if you've ever watched the Shark Week show, you've heard bull sharks are the only species of shark that can enter fresh water. That's not true. There's a whole group of sharks called the river shark, genus Glyphis, G-L-Y-P-H-I-S, that spend almost their whole lives in rivers. I wrote about this in one of my scuba diving magazine columns uh, about amazing shark facts that you probably haven't heard before. There are also thresher sharks. Watch in the upper right there. Thresher sharks have this crazy long tail and they use it like a whip to stun prey. Hammerheads, a lot of people do know about, but a question I get a lot is what do you use, uh, what do they use that hammer for? Well, they use it's extra surface area for their electrosensory system. Sharks have this ability to sense electric fields. Uh, and they they that means that if a prey animal is hiding under the sand where you can't see it or hear it or smell it, they can still tell it's there from sensing the electricity given off by its beating heart. And then they also use their hammer, hammer shape uh, to pin. Uh, prey, flat prey like stingrays, as you see here, or flounders or things like that to the bottom. I've worked on these uh, during some of my PhD work. If anyone is curious, all of my peer-reviewed published scientific papers are available for free on my website. Uh, basking sharks are another really cool species. They were uh, a species of some concern where I lived most recently in Vancouver, British Columbia, um, and they are found uh, off the waters of the UK where I know uh, some, of, some folks are, are watching from but they are filter feeders, just like the whale sharks. And a question I saw in the chat box earlier, whale sharks are definitely sharks, they're not whales. They're called whale sharks because they're big and because they, they filter feed like whales, or like whales do, but they are definitely sharks. Greenland sharks are another really cool species. These are the ones that live under Arctic ice. They can live to be over 400 years old and they eat polar bears and reindeer. Uh, some of the, one of the craziest species out there. Uh, and that video in the upper right is not slowed down. That is how slow they swim. They are the slowest swimming, slowest swimming cruising speed of any large fish ever measured. Uh, goblin sharks uh, have this crazy protruding jaw. Uh, they can protrude their jaw farther and faster than any other known species of shark. Uh, and my favorite shark is the sandbar shark. Again, follow hashtag best shark to learn more about why I love them. And that image on the bottom, that is my uh, consultancy's logo. I also have that logo on a credit card. So love sandbar sharks. Uh, they were my master study animal. You can see in the photo on the left side. So they were the first, they weren't the first shark species I ever saw, but they were the first shark species I ever saw a lot of. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that sharks have this ability to sense electric fields uh, that they can use it to find prey and also to navigate. And that's what that looks like on a shark's snout. Uh, you can see that little dot, those little dots uh, that almost look like the shark needs to shave. Uh, those are filled with this electrosensitive jelly that can detect electric fields. Where baby sharks come from is actually int both interesting and important for their conservation. Some species give live birth, as you see on the left side there, that's a lemon shark being born. Some species lay eggs. As you see on the right there, that's a skate egg case with the top cut off so you can see what's happening in an aquarium. Some species have a weird mix of this that's only found in sharks. Some species can clone themselves. If a mom shark wants to have babies and there's no dad around, she will just become pregnant and uh, will give birth to a litter of pups that are exact genetic replicas of herself. Uh, but what this means in terms of shark conservation is sharks have relatively few young, relatively late in life, relatively infrequently compared to other species of fish that spawn. 
And what that means is they are vulnerable to overfishing. It is very easy for humans to take too many sharks out of the population. Sharks are important for a lot of reasons. Uh, the biggest one is as predators, they help keep the food web in balance. And uh, in terms of uh, the food web that we're talking about here, uh, the ocean is a, a food, uh, has many different ecosystems in it that in total provide food for billions of humans and, in, and jobs for tens of millions of humans. It's very important that we get this right. Sharks also are important ecologically because of something called fear ecology. Fear ecology is uh, when the, pres the mere presence of a predator, even if it doesn't eat anything, affects prey species. It causes them to maybe not go forage in a particular area because they think there's a predator around. If you've ever been walking downtown and there was a shortcut, but it was through a dark alley and you decided to go a little longer way around rather than go through that dark alley, that's a shortcut. That's the same premise as fear ecology. Sharks also support fisheries all over the world. And I, I mentioned earlier, unsustainable overfishing uh, is a big problem for sharks, but there are sustainable shark fisheries, especially in the US. So sharks are an important source of food and jobs directly. And they're also important for wildlife tourism, for people that like to go scuba diving with sharks. And this can help uh, local economies uh, have an economic incentive to help protect shark species in their local waters. Sharks are in trouble. 24%, uh, nearly one out of every four known species of sharks and their relatives is considered threatened with extinction by the IUCN Red List, an international group of scientific experts. And overfishing, unsustainable fisheries are the largest threat by far. Uh, climate change, generally not that big a threat to sharks, though it is to some uh, many ocean species. Plastic pollution, generally not a big threat to sharks, though it is to some ocean species, especially marine mammals and sea turtles. Uh, but sharks, it, the threat is humans are killing too many of them. This is not just for fins. This is also for meat. Uh, this is not just on purpose. Sometimes it's unintentional, what we call bycatch. Uh, and in general, it's a, it's, a, it's a more complicated problem than some people would have you believe. Uh, so I want to end here with uh, the sort of stuff you can do to help before I get into questions. I know we have people from all over the world and people of all ages watching, so I'll try to keep this general. But the biggest thing that I recommend to people if you want to help the ocean is support sustainable seafood and don't buy unsustainable seafood. And let me tell you what that means and how to do that. Uh, so I meant, uh, so basically when humans fish, when humans catch fish to remove from the ocean to sell for food, uh, there are there's some number of fish that we can do, that we can remove from the ocean safely without hurting the population of those fish, without hurting the environment. That's sustainable seafood. That's a sustainable fishery. When we take too many, that's unsustainable overfishing. So I encourage sustainable seafood buying. And how you can tell, there's a great guide for this in the US uh, called Seafood Watch. It's made by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. You can download a free app uh, and it gives you a, you tell it where you are and it gives you a list of all the seafood in your area divided into a green list. You can eat this and it's sustainable and it's good for the environment. A yellow list, you can eat this every once in a while sometimes. And a red list, maybe avoid that. Uh, the, in the UK, the Marine Conservation Society of the UK has what's called a good fish guide. It's a similar concept. In Canada, OceanWise is a similar concept. There's a lot of these sustainable seafood guides and most of them are pretty solid. Something you can do is write to your elected officials and write to groups like NOAA uh, to ask them uh, to better protect shark species and better protect the ocean. An important point here is you need to do this in response to a particular policy issue. And you can't just write and say, save sharks. You have to say, I oppose Amendment 17C because of so-and-so, and I support Amendment 6B because of so-and-so. And that's hard, and you might not know that. So following experts uh, on social media, subscribing to listservs, things like that is really, really important here because we know what to do and how to help. Uh, and sharing, learning correct information from reliable sources and telling your friends is also really important. And part of that is also not sharing unreliable information from people who don't know what they're talking about. If you have, if you're able, the ability to donate time and money to scientists or to nonprofits uh, can be really, really helpful. In general, for the, for the ocean, reducing your carbon footprint if you can and using less single use plastic if you can is great. I want to briefly mention that there are a lot of things that people are doing uh, to try and help that are not helping. Uh, there are a lot of misconception about what shark finning is. I know we have a lot of listeners in Florida uh, where some of the Sharks for Kids team is based. I see a lot of petitions like this one on the left that say ban shark finning in Florida. 
that are made by individual users. Uh, we did ban shark finning in Florida in 1993. So this, there's a lot of misinformation and petitions like this cannot possibly help anything. Don't share information from unreliable sources. There are people who think that it's funny to, to engage in wildlife harassment with sharks as seen in the middle photo here, to ride sharks, to grab sharks. Uh, and they think that they're somehow helping by showing that sharks aren't dangerous. This is not helping. Uh, and there's also a lot of people who wrongly believe that scientists are the big threat facing sharks. And if sharks, scientists would just leave sharks alone, they'd be fine. This is not true. I wrote about that. It, that's one of my uh, scuba diving magazine columns. So I want to, on that regard, I'm not saying there's nothing you can do to help. I'm not saying that it's bad that you want to help. But wanting to help is great. Trying to help is great. But wanting to help and trying to help are not the same thing as actually helping. Ask experts what we need. You don't need to reinvent the wheel poorly on your own. Uh, so I want to I want to close here with one of my favorite quotes. Uh, this is from a Senegalese conservationist, Baba Dayoum. He was talking about gorillas, but I think it works for sharks too. In the end, we'll conserve only what we love. We'll love only what we understand, and we'll understand only what we are taught. Uh, I hope you I taught you a little bit something today. And if you don't love sharks, maybe you at least you appreciate them and have a better understanding of why we should protect them and how we can. Uh, I, we have some time for questions here, but if, you, if anyone uh, has, if I don't get to your question, I invite you to follow me on social media at Why Sharks Matter on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and I will try to answer your questions at a later time. And if anyone uh, would like me to speak to your school group or local club or anything like that, there's information for how to contact me on my website, davidschiffmancv.com. I'm going to stop screen sharing here so uh, folks can see my, my face and my awesome shark hat again. Uh, and I will, I think Jenny uh, does the moderation for the questions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, David. That was fantastic. Um, we definitely have lots of questions coming in. I'll try and- 102, out. my God. Okay. Yeah. I've been answering a few as we go along, but um, some of them come back quite a lot. We have a lot of questions about river sharks. Can you tell yeah. us- little bit more about them because I know they're really interesting and I actually found out about them thanks to you because I spotted you sharing what they were and I'd never actually heard of them before. Um, yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about river sharks? Absolutely. So the genus, uh, so with your, your, your taxonomy, you have kingdom, phylum, class order, family, genus, species, they're genus glyphus. Uh, they are found in Southeast Asia and uh, North Australia. They are critically endangered uh, because be, living in rivers means they live closer to humans than ocean, open ocean sharks are. And in general, a pretty good predictor of how threatened a species is, is how close it lives to humans, uh, which is sad and scary. But uh, they are, uh, there is someone on Twitter, uh, Dr. Peter Kine, uh, his Twitter is at Spotted Cat Shark. He studies them and he has a lot of cool pictures about them but they are a really neat species. Uh, they spend almost their entire lives in rivers and they are in deep, or a really neat group of species and they are in big trouble, unfortunately. But yeah, and I love them. And every time Shark Week says, bull sharks are the only species that can enter fresh water, it makes me cringe inside because it's not true. Uh, it, it has not been true for the entire run of Shark Week. Uh, they, we, glyphosate sharks are not a new discovery, uh, but yeah, they're super cool. And there's three species of glyphus, right? I think that's right, something like that. Uh, it's not very many. And there's always debates among taxonomists of what's a species and what's a subspecies. And uh, I think it's three. Uh, the people are gonna, Pete and Dave are gonna kill me if I get this wrong, but it's something like that. Uh, and just a note on discovering new species, uh, scientists discover a new species of shark, skate, ray, or chimera on average, about every two weeks. Uh, and that's been true for the last decade or so. So there's a lot left to, to discover, which does not mean that Megalodon is still out there. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, well, speaking of Megalodon, do you know when it went extinct? Around 2 million years ago, uh, a little less than that. Uh, and there's a, just a new thing that came out today about this that uh, an, another possible reason why they went extinct uh, was competition with newly evolving smaller, faster species. Uh, but we believe that it's a mix of climate change and the evolution of cooperative hunting and orcas and uh, changes in food availability or what did them in. And do you know if it um, had any predators? 
I would imagine when as an adult, probably not. Uh, there were some pretty crazy things living in ancient seas, but the Megalodon was, uh, was pretty close to the top of the food chain. But even now, the great white is a, a very impressive predator and orcas eat it for lunch. So uh, there may have been something, but they were pretty close to the top. This was a picture of 50 foot long great white shark that could bite whales in half. Uh, that's what we're talking about here. Okay, um, so we had a question about which species of sharks has the largest population? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't really know. Uh, the, there are, it's, it's hard to say. There are some species that are more common than others. I know where I used to work off the coast of Florida, uh, that nurse sharks were the most common large shark species. Uh, and there were lot, also lots of Atlantic sharp noses, and you get those crazy helicopter recordings of uh, the, the black tip shark migration every year off of Southeast Florida. Uh, and I don't know uh, worldwide what would have the biggest population. And, and of course, with um, population declines, that might be changing other yes. things. Um, okay, so um, you met, you, you, uh, sort of touched on it a second ago, but besides humans, what do sharks have any other predators? So the answer is yes. Uh, not all sharks are the top of the food chain. Uh, even the great white can be eaten by orcas. Uh, tiger sharks, uh, are, uh, tiger sharks, threshers also taken out by orcas. The uh, bull sharks are eaten by crocodiles sometimes in areas where they co-inhabit. I've seen videos of newborn bonnet heads uh, being taken out by ospreys, small seabirds. Um, seals sometimes eat sharks. Uh, uh, octopuses sometimes eat sharks. So yeah, uh, they do have. A, there are there are lots of species, and some of them are quite small. And even the big ones uh, are not as impressive as an orca in terms of predation. Orcas are the the baddest uh, baddest thing out there. And and sharks can be cannibals as well quite often. Yeah, oh yes. Yeah, sharks eat other sharks all the time. Um, okay. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, you, so talking about shark conservation, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned donating money towards uh, scientists or NGOs. Yes. Um, how, what advice can you give to someone who might want to do that about how to choose an organization to give to? Sure. So a, a responsible, reputable, credible environmental nonprofit should make it very clear that they are responsible, reputable, and credible on their website. Uh, they will have a list of, here's what we do, here's who we work with, here are some of our past successes. And if it doesn't have that, that should be a red flag. Uh, and if, uh, and there are lots and lots and lots and lots of groups out there. I identified at least 78 uh, nonprofits that work on shark issues around the English speaking world during some of my postdoc research. Uh, some of them do amazing work. Some of them are pretty questionable. Um, if you just, if all they say is we're raising awareness and trying to get people to save sharks, that's perhaps not great. Uh, unless it's explicitly an education organization, like Sharks for Kids does amazing education for kids all over the world. Uh, but you guys are not necessarily an advocacy group. So sometimes may round up people. Uh, but there are some that are, are really downright fraudulent, uh, and that's a, that's a problem. Uh, there are some that are started by one person and run out of their basement, and they don't ever do anything, but they are quoted in the news a lot as an expert, and they, uh, they ask for money all the time, and they take money away from other causes because they lie and make things sound scary and say, you need to give me money so that we can protect the ocean. Uh, my go-to nonprofit, if you're interested in really making a difference in uh, protecting sharks from unsustainable overfishing and working on issues that other groups really aren't working on uh, is Shark Advocates International. Uh, it's sharkadvocates.org is the website. It's a small organization, so small donations go a long way. They do a lot of really good work, uh, including a lot of things that literally no one else in the world is doing. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so, um, this question I asked uh, every single one of the guests that I in, uh, interview, and this is a question that one you must get often and we get, off, get often, is what's your advice for children who, for children and older, like older students maybe as well, 
um, who want to go into marine biology or marine conservation? Yeah. So first, I want to stress uh, that marine biology, marine conservation, and marine conservation biology are different things. Uh, marine biology is the scientific study of animals that live in the ocean. Marine conservation is usually advocacy, uh, trying to get people to change laws. And marine conservation biology, which is a mix of that, is uh, what I do, and it's more rare and newer. Uh, but if you want to study, if you want to go into marine conservation advocacy, I'm not the one to talk to. If you want to go into marine biology or marine conservation biology, you're talking about uh, studying science in school. Uh, if you want to be a scientist, you're going to need to go to what's called graduate school, which is college after college. Uh, I, my dad joked at one point that I was in 23rd grade, and he was right. Uh, so I went to, I studied biology uh, in my undergraduate at my university, and then I got a master's in marine biology, and then I got a PhD in ecosystem science and policy. Uh, so uh, all, all in all, uh, that's, that's a lot of school. It's a lot of work. Uh, in the meantime, for the younger kids out there that aren't quite thinking about college yet, uh, just read all you can, watch all the documentaries you can find. When all this is over, go back to the zoo and the aquarium and the science museum. In the meantime, there's a lot of great online activities like these webinars from Sharks for Kids and a lot of other similar groups are stepping up to provide great content like this. Uh, there are, just learn as much as you can. And once you get into college, uh, the best thing you can do is get research experience. Uh, what you exactly study, everyone is gonna be pretty similar. But learning how to do science, even if the research project you're doing is totally unrelated to the ocean, just saying, I know how to work in a lab, I know how to analyze data, I know how to write up a paper, that's huge. Um, and I guess bouncing off that, do you, mm -hmm. um, as someone asked us, how, like, they are in an, if they are in an um, um, graduate studies, or even before that, on undergraduate studies, what advice do you have for someone looking for opportunities? Where would they find them, and how would they choose them? Yeah, so graduate school is a little different from undergraduate in that you're not really applying to a school, you're applying to a particular lab most of the time. It's almost like a medieval apprenticeship. You find a, a, a senior professor who is willing to take graduate students and they will run you, they will, uh, you'll be housed in their lab and you'll take some classes, but most of the time you're doing your own research under their supervision. And how you find these people is you can't just say, I want to study sharks, I want to study dolphins. No one's going to listen to you if you do that. You have to have a specific research question. I'm interested in the migratory behavior of spinner sharks uh, and if it's disrupted by climate change. I'm interested in how ocean acidification is affecting the stress of hammerheads, things like that. Uh, then you find who is doing that kind of work and you do that just with a, a, a literature search. Look for peer-reviewed scientific journal articles uh, about that topic and look who's writing them and find their lab websites and reach out to them. Uh, or I know that some of the more famous shark scientists will get hundreds of emails a year from people wanting to join their labs and they might not have any spots at all. They might have one, very rarely they'd have two spots. So it's very competitive, but you can also sort of create your own project, which is what I did during my master's. There was no one working on shark stuff when I was there. Uh, so I, uh, my, my supervisor worked on other fish, especially tuna and, and said, yeah, sure, we can do something with sharks. We'll figure it out together. Uh, so we were able to put something together like that, which was great. Fantastic, thank you. Um, okay, so I don't know if you talked about this, but so we've had a few questions about um, sharks cloning themselves. Yeah, um, it's the big fancy science word for that is called parthenogenesis. It's crazy. And how they first discovered this was at an aquarium. Uh, this was an aquarium in Omaha, Nebraska, which those of you not familiar with U.S. geography, that is the middle of the U.S. There is not ocean for a long way in any direction. And they had a bunch of female bonnethead sharks in a tank. And that was true for years. And one day they, the zookeepers came in and there were a bunch of baby bonnethead sharks in there. And they said, that's weird. And they called in a scientist and he did genetic testing and found that... Uh, they were, in fact, all clones, all exact genetic copies of one of the mothers. This has since been found in a lot of other species, and it's even been observed in the wild in sawfish. Uh, the, advantage, the disadvantage of this, the reason why there's male-female mating in terms of uh, biology, 
is increasing genetic diversity. More diversity is good from a DNA perspective. Uh, you're a mix of your mom and your dad. Uh, and mo that's true in most animals. But sometimes there's not a dad around and the mom might still want to pass on her genes. Isn't that wild? Yeah, I, we have a, in, in Plymouth in the UK, they have the zebra sharks to do, do, yeah. do that. Yeah, so, yeah, it's really cool. Um, I, I, I thought that the zebra shark was um, genetically different from the mother, but I can't remember if that was true or not, so. Another weird thing that sharks, some sharks can do that was discovered in captivity is after mating, the female shark can store the, the, the genetic material from the dad uh, until she's ready to become pregnant for years. Yeah. The record is four years. The, the female mated with, with a male and said, you know what, I would like to become pregnant at some point, but not right now, and just kept, this, kept the genetic material from the dad for four years and then decided to become pregnant. Isn't there also evidence of um, pups being from different um, fathers in, yeah. in shock? Yeah, that's called multiple paternity. Uh, and that helps spread genetic diversity. Uh, what happens is a, a female shark will mate with multiple males during the same mating season, and then will become pregnant by several of them simultaneously, and then will give birth to a litter of pups that are half siblings to each other. They all have the same mother, but different fathers, even though they were born at the same time, which is crazy. A lot of different species do that. Uh, and while we're talking about reproduction, um, you, you touched on the three different types of, of reproduction that um, sharks have. Mm -hmm. um, there's also been some very cool research recently where um, we've had images of ultrasounds coming out yeah. showing some interest in behavior in the womb. Yeah, crazy stuff. Uh, so uh, my PhD supervisor, Dr. Neil Hammerschlag, and my current Arizona State colleague, Dr. James Sulikowski, who may have been a speaker on this last week, yeah. Uh, he that so he's uh, they're doing this crazy stuff with ultrasound that it works just like a human ultrasound for when when a mom is pregnant and you can really see the pups in there and sometimes you can see them moving around um, and in one case they observe them going from one uterus into another uterus uh, to eat the the uh, other pups sand tiger sharks in particular. Uh, they have what's called a oviphagy, which means uh, basically they eat each other in the womb and only one is born, uh, which is crazy. So if you ever think that if you're home, home uh, for a while and you think your brother's driving you crazy, uh, it could have been worse. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right, okay. So let's look through these questions and see if there's anything we've missed. Right. And if there's any questions of yours that I didn't get to, uh, remember, uh, you can find me on, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Why Sharks Matter. I'm happy to answer questions there. But if there's more, or I, I, I have more time. I don't know how long you have scheduled for me. Uh, but yeah, if there's more questions now, happy to answer them. Uh, are people able to access the uh, presentation anywhere? Uh, for this one, no. Uh, but but uh, I have some, some of the images and stuff and some of the facts are available uh, on, on my website, which is davidschiffmancv.com. Uh, I'll make sure that that's in the description of the YouTube video or in a comment somewhere. Uh, and Why Sharks Matter on every social media platform, Why Sharks Matter at Gmail if you wanna email me. Uh, happy to answer questions later. Great, thank you so much. I think we've uh, made the rounds. Maybe um, one last question. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about why you love sand sandbar sharks so much? Sure. So sandbar sharks, uh, just picture a typical sharky shark. Uh, they're the classic model. They don't have a crazy face or crazy tail or stripes uh, or crazy eyes. They're just a classic model shark. Uh, but they are, uh, for millions of children around the world, they're the first shark that they ever see because they're found in aquariums all over the world. Uh, they do very well in aquariums. Sometimes they're called brown sharks. Um, and because of that, there are, when kids see a shark in an aquarium for the first time, they, it can inspire a lifelong love of sharks, a lifelong love of wanting to protect the ocean and learn more. So uh, sandbar sharks really punch above their weight because uh, they're, if you follow the hashtag best shark on Twitter and Instagram, you'll not only see me uh, geeking out about how much I love sandbar sharks, but you'll also see a lot of other marine scientists uh, teasing me for picking what they perceive as a lame shark. 
but they they need love. They can do uh, they do great stuff. Uh, and again, they were also my master study animals. So they were they were not the first shark I ever saw, but they were the first shark I ever saw a lot of. Love them. Fantastic. And I guess that's one of the really cool things about aquariums is that you, it's a fantastic way for children to connect with the ocean, mm -hmm. even when they don't live near it or can't go to it. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, again, I think we'll finish it there. Once again, if anyone has any questions they didn't get answered, you can either go to uh, David's social media, our social media, um, or our website, which I'm just going to show you very quickly um, where you can find our website. So the um, address is sharksforkids.com and we have lots of um, really great resources, um, both for teachers and students, including some uh, fact sheets. So if you're looking about any information about a specific shark, you can go on there. And we have some great crafts for anyone who is um, stuck at home for everyone who is stuck at home. Um, you can do all these things from home, which are a really great resource. And you can also find all of our upcoming uh, webinars and the past ones that have been recorded as well. There we go. Thank you so much, David. Um, and uh, thank you so much to everyone who's been watching. Um, it's been great to talk to you. Thanks and, for having uh, me. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, so this will be posted on YouTube. It's live right now, but um, it will also be posted on YouTube so we can share the link afterwards. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a good day, everyone. Stay Bye. safe.